we want to start sort of at the beginning. Why, why did you feel it necessary to write a book about another book about the Beatles and the history of the Beatles? So many have been written. Well, there are so many books. Um, I don't know how many people here have Beatle books on their shelves, but I have about 500 at home. <laughs> and um, myself, I've done half a dozen in the past, but they were all reference books. And most of the Beatles books are a niche area of the subject. And they look at it and they go quite deep on it. But that's, you know, that's, they're quite specialist in, a, in, in that way. In terms of biography, there are still very few. And um, I, I didn't feel that any single biography had ever really covered the Beatles in the way that I wanted to read about it and in the way that I think their story demands and deserves. So um, I just decided that I would do it, but I would do it with a difference in that I would write about it in deeply in three volumes. Because if you try and cram this story in all its many ramifications into one book, then you are going to have to leave out a lot of material that's ne absolutely necessary to the understanding. So the idea came up for this three-volume series. And um, I was able to get a publisher in the UK and here in the US. Thank you to my team who are here today brilliantly. Um, and they were really patient because it took a while. And, um, but the idea is that this story, in my opinion, has never really been told properly before. And the idea is to press the refresh button on something that we think we know mm. and to actually look at it again from the top to the bottom, from the side to the side, every, every which way, and do it properly. Now, we are at Google, so obviously we want to talk a little bit about research. Yeah. Uh, because when I'm, you know, a long time ago when people did their books, uh, it was libraries and phone disks and no internet. You've mm. had the, uh, the f good fortune of having the internet, you know, but you've also done the old-fashioned way as well. Yeah. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about the research you did? Well, I figure that if you only research your book on the internet, then b by definition you're not going to be able to get anything that is special and unique to you because you're gonna, it, it will be something that has been found before, has been typed by someone and is up there because someone's put it up there. Mm. Um, so obviously the internet is a phenomenal resource and we all use it and uh, it, it, it was a great help to me on this project in every way. But at the same time you can't beat doing old fashioned detective work and getting out there and burning shoe leather. <laughs> uh, and I burned shoe leather and, and car tires and whatever, I, you know, I needed to go wherever the information was. <clears throat> and this story is now quite an old story. I mean, it, the book begins in the 19th century. But even when the book really begins to accelerate after they're born, the Beatles are all war babies, which is quite important to the story. The, when you're looking at 1940s and 50s and 60s resource materials, a lot of that is still not available on the internet. You have to go to the libraries, you have to go in, into the archives, and you have to do proper research. So it's a combination. I always say with this book, I go where the information is. Mm -hmm. If it's easily available, I'll grab it easily. If it's difficult to obtain, I'll go that extra mile. So where was the information? The information is in personal and private hands. It's in our public archives and libraries. Uh, it's in corporate archives. It's in old newspapers and magazines and books and radio and television and film. It's whatever you need to go, or wherever you need to go, and whatever you need to do. So a lot of time in the Liverpool Record Office, which is looking at birth records and school records in Liverpool, England. Um, a lot of the time in the archives of the BBC or the archives of their record company, EMI. Um, none of that stuff's been digitized, so you have to go to it. Um, and in particular, archives of people who had an association with them, like lawyers who might have kept legal files or, mm. or broadcasters who kept files, all that kind of stuff. Now, Mark, it, there's been so much written about the music. You started way back with uh, literally the birth of each of the individual members of the group. Mm. Um, but when it comes to uh, going back to Liverpool, going back to you're relying on people's memories, you're relying on a combination of information that's been available and, as you say, newly discovered uh, information. You found some conflict, of course, amongst yeah. all of this. So how did you work through all of the many, many conflicting stories? About well, the Beatles? the Beatles is often the biggest thing that ever happened to someone in their life. If, if they had an association with the Beatles, you can imagine there's something that they talk about for, forevermore. Uh, most people, not all. Um, 
and inevitably along the way, the stories begin to gather layers that weren't actually necessarily there in the first place. Mm. Mm. So one of the things that I can bring to the project like this is that I, I have a wealth of background knowledge. I've been doing this now for 30 odd years professionally. Yeah. So you have to know when people are talking bull, mm. basically. Uh, and I have a very strong sense of that. And I won't use anything, no matter how exciting the story, if someone's telling me something that I know will look good on the page, but I don't quite believe it, I, I won't use it. And what about because accuracy is absolutely everything to a book like this. There's no point in doing this again unless it's accurate. Right. What about the George Harrison quote that uh, is in the book? Uh, would you, in the, there's a quote in the book where, where George says, in their bid to tell what they know, some people tell more than what they know. <laughs> Um, yeah. And that is the same thing, you know, um, stories become embroidered with time. And you know, in an interview, even where I'm, I'm really comfortable with what someone's telling me as the, as the truth, I, there'll still be something that I won't use. Um, and there are some people I won't go to at all because I know, that, I know what they're going to say and I, I know it's unusable. The script. Yeah, script. yeah, it's yeah. a script. And, um, you know, some people actually have made a living out of putting themselves more centrally into a picture they, ne they were never in in the first place. Right. <laughs> Mark, uh, you've been doing research on the Beatles for, like I said, over 30 years. Did you set up, um, it, when you would do interviews along the way, yeah. were you thinking about this book at this point? Because no. you, you, have, you obviously have a great archive of uh, interviews with yeah. the Beatles themselves. Yeah. Um, no, I, I I didn't know I was going to be doing this until I until pretty much when I started it. Um, so all the times in the past I've had access to people I could have asked them certain things yeah. and didn't. Mm. But you know I I didn't have that foresight. Um, but this is very much a book of information. And uh, when you know with Beatle collectors, I am a, a Beatle fan. Uh, but at the same time, an I'm an independent professional historian. So I, I have the the enthusiasm of, of a fan to carry me through a long project like this, but I'm not interested in polishing their reputation in any way. So uh, this is not a book saying, hey, weren't the Beatles great? This is an independent history, and it doesn't pull any punches. Um, but it's, it's essentially a book of information, and Beatle fans collect different things, and I, more than anything else, collect information. And I have, I've had incredible access to archives through working for the Beatles for so long. Uh, and been in, been in many good situations uh, where I've had access to archives, and I always take the moment if I if I can, if there's an opportunity. So I have filing cabinets full of full of history, basically, right. and that's all going to go into these three books. But we could add, though, that while the book is information, there's quite a bit of humor, and that is really wonderful. There's a, a great humorous aspect, partly because as we've talked about, the Beatles themselves were... Well, the, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. they're just such funny guys. And uh, their story always makes me laugh. I still laugh hysterically at most aspects of the Beatles. And uh, it's really important that a book like this should have humor in it. And um, I'm glad, glad that you noticed that. Yeah. How, how important is the fact that they're from Liverpool and not London or someplace else? It's crucial. It's crucial. Liverpool, I mean, we live in a world now where rock music is everywhere. You can't avoid it. Even when you want to avoid it, you can't avoid it. Um, but we're talking here, and this is a contextual history, so I'm writing about the 1950s and 60s, when rock music was the music of delinquents. And it was greatly frowned upon in mainstream society. Adults did not get it. It was not their music. They, they thought it was associated with hoodlums, um, and therefore they shunned it. Uh, and what was the question? <laughs> How important was the fact that the Beatles are from Liverpool? Yeah, so we live in a world now full of rock music and rock bands are everywhere. Uh, in those days, in the late 50s, early 60s, there was no real rock band scene anywhere in America. There had been some rock and roll and corporate America was trying to suppress it, to kill it off with the payola scandal and all of that of the late 1950s. <clears throat> and it really survived primarily in England, uh, where everybody in England, all the kids in England growing up who loved American music, they didn't want anything from England. It had to be American. Mm. Uh, and in England, there was really only one place where there was a scene, where there were bands forming, mates playing, playing guitars, swapping chords, swapping songs, getting up on stage and singing. It wasn't London, it was Liverpool. It was the only place in the world, in other words, that had a rock band scene. Uh, 
And the Beatles initially, they weren't in the first wave of that. They were not there at its formative period. They joined it after two or three years it had been up and running. And they, when they got back from Germany the first time, which is another story, they took it over. And they were the kings very, very quickly. And they were different from everybody else because they were original. The Beatles always broke all the rules. They were always original. They were, they were never tied by any convention. They thought differently. They looked different. They acted different. And they were the kings. Well, they also played different songs from the other bands because they would often look at a B-side, let's say. You know, yeah. Which is something you don't think about. Yeah. Because you'd want to play the A-side because everyone knew it. Yeah. The, I mean, the Beatles didn't have iPlayers. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I didn't have iPads or iPods or anything like that. They were in record shop listening booths. Browseries, they were called, and they would all squeeze themselves in and they would ask the assistant behind the counter to play this one, this one, this one, this one, all, and whatever they picked that was from America. They only wanted to play American music and they would be crowded into these browseries and they would, one of them very quickly would say something was crap, usually John, <laughs> uh, and they would take it off and they would put on the next one and then someone, Paul, would say, I'll do this one. Mm. And, or John would say, I'll do this one, or George would say, I'll do this one. And that's how they got a repertoire. But they looked for the unusual. So they went to the B-sides and they went for the really obscure tracks that no one else was even playing. Yeah. And they popularized a lot of American music that way that wasn't even popular here. Yeah, and they actually, um, they made uh, African-American music accessible here to white people yeah. in America, yeah. which was a very big thing for them. They were very proud of it because they were not into the segregation, and yeah. correct? The Beatles' first album is, um, is principally a New York sound. It's the music of um, 1650 Broadway, properly known as the Brill Building, but actually that was across the street. <laughs> it's the music of Jerry Goffin and Carol King and, and, acts like, and songwriters like that, uh, Burt Bacharach and Hal David. And that was the first album. The second album was really a Detroit sound. Mm -hmm. They were looking for the Motown sound, the Tamla Motown sound. And then they exploded in America and were able to give back to you the music that was yours in the first place, but often hadn't been heard before. And they actually brought that music uh, out of just the club scene by being the first to perform a Tamla Motown track on the BBC radio. Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, the Beatles first appeared on the radio in England in a session before they actually had a recording contract. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one of the songs they played in their first broadcast was Please Mr. Postman by the Marvelettes on Tamla. Uh, and I thought, I wonder how many times that record or anything else from Tamla had been played on British radio before. So again, this is uh, nothing digitized here. I spent days going through microfilm records, wearing out my eyes, <laughs> turning the, the film round and round and round on all the BBC program output records. <laughs> so every record played in every radio show it would be logged and I went through the logs, and they, it turned out that my hunch was right. They were the first to play a Tamla, a Tamla sound from Detroit wow. on BBC Radio. And then in their next broadcast, they played a song, Ask Me Why, that was based on a Tamla record mm -hmm. or inspired by a Tamla record. So that was also a first. They, I'm sure, didn't know any of this. Right, right. They were just doing it. You know, it's, right. it's down to the historian to come along and put it into context. But they were doing it. They were the first. You know, we, uh, let's go back in the past just a little bit. We've, we've gone to the music, and we'll get back to that, because we really need to find out how the Beatles did get their music. Uh, you had mentioned it a little bit, but let's go back to the, the childhoods, because, uh, again, you say the book is a social history with the Beatles at the center of it. Yeah. So let's talk about each Beatle uh, briefly, about their childhood and musically what they had and such. Okay. So starting with? That boy, John Lennon. Okay. Um, John Lennon, uh, John, Paul, and George, all the product of uh, Catholic Protestant marriages, which is an unusual mix in Liverpool, which had a particularly strong religious divide. You would normally stick to your own religion. Mm -hmm. Most unusual that three of the Beatles actually have that mixed background, uh, which I think is probably part, it is part of their makeup. I'm not quite sure what it says, but <laughs> it's part of who they are. Um, John Lennon was born in 1940 when Liverpool was being bombed by the Germans. Liverpool was very, very badly bombed by the Nazis in the Second World War. Uh, he wasn't born in an air raid, but all the same, there were bombs falling very close by within a day or two of where he was born. And uh, he was born to uh, a father who was a merchant seaman who was actually plying the Atlantic route uh, 
with the U-boats lurking in the deep, so very risky job. Uh, and a mother, that was, was Alf Lennon and his mother Julia, uh, Julia Al John's mother Julia Lennon was a very liberal woman in her time. Um, they had married, but they didn't really ever have much of a relationship. There are no photographs of John Lennon's parents together, <laughs> not from their wedding day or any of the years they were together. In fact, they weren't together very much. Um, but Julia was unusual uh, in that she was, um, she was very attractive to men, and the fact that she was married didn't stop her from mm. courting other men. And she had four children to three different men in nine years, which sounds more like today's behavior, if, if anything, than 1940s behavior. Yes. It obviously marked her out as very unusual in her time. Uh, but they never really got the hang of bringing up their son together. Uh, and John was kind of passed from one to the other. When Alf was back, he would be, you know, John would see his dad. Otherwise, he was with his mum, but the mum was mostly going out at night. So he was really raised by his auntie, his aunt and uncle, his aunt Mimi and his uncle George. And they gave him the stability that he needed. And in 1946, he became the guardian uh, of his aunt Mimi and uncle George permanently. And they also provided... I think harmonica to him. Yeah, he um, he was uh, John's mother was very musical. She played ukulele, and John's father played harmonica. But I don't think John necessarily knew that. Okay. Um, and but he he was very good musically. He had a natural musical talent, but he also had a great facility for words. Okay. He was writing re really inventive comic poetry and doing lots of drawing from infancy onwards. That was an influence of Mimi because she had been uh, an avid reader. Yeah, and yeah, brought John, that to influence him in that way. John Lennon was an avid reader his entire life. He would read uh, a book or two a week and a newspaper or two every day, cover to cover. And he, he did that until until the day he was shot. So he was always reading. And what about Paul McCartney? Paul, on his mother's side, there's not so much music there. She was a, a midwife. Um, but on, his, on Paul's father's side, there was a lot of music. His dad actually had a band. Uh, and much as the Beatles were playing the Liverpool halls and club circuit in the 1960s, so his dad had been doing that 40 years earlier with Jim Max Band. <laughs> Jim McCartney had Jim Max Band. He was the leader, and he played piano and, and uh, trumpet and wrote a tune. So Paul McCartney was not the first in his family to write a song. Mm. <laughs> uh, his dad wrote one before him. And actually his dad had been a musician as well, playing Northern England brass band music which I don't think is so well known here, but <laughs> very nice kind of brass music. Now, Richie, I mean, we, we know him as Ringo, but throughout the book, for the most part, he's Ringo when we talk about him on stage, but he's Richie. Yeah, I, I, there's, the no, there's no hindsight in this book, so I can't call him Ringo until he becomes Ringo. He's about right. 20 years old by then. Right. Um, right. And similarly, I don't use the word Beatles anywhere until they actually come up with the name, because until that point, they're not they're Beatles. Not. Right. Um, so he's Richie, Richie Starkey. Right. And oh, good. he had, there's a little bit of music in his background, but not too much, but um, mostly it was family parties. Liverpool is a very musical city. It's another reason why they had a, a, a rock band scene there. Mm. And that's because Liverpool is a very musical place. It's the Irish, the strongly Irish heritage there. People, you go to pubs, you sing at a, at a family party. Everyone is expected in turn to have a turn. So it would come to your turn and you would have to get up and read a piece of poetry or sing or whatever. And they all had these musical events in their background. Um, but Richie, the, the biggest thing about his childhood is that he was seriously ill twice. Uh, on the first occasion, he was seven years old. He very nearly died three times. His mother was told he wouldn't last the night. And poor woman, she was, Ringo was, or Richie was her only child. And she would have to go home on the bus from hospital thinking she'd never see him again. <laughs> but he was always a tough little kid. Not, not necessarily physically, but emotionally, mentally, he is still a very tough guy. Ringo. And didn't he also, at these parties after he was sickly and came home, he used to sing Nobody's Child? <laughs> yeah. Um, he liked, Richie liked country music from America. Uh, and whereas there is a bit of a myth that the Beatles always got their music from the sailors who sailed between New York and Liverpool, in reality, they actually got their records from shops, as I was saying. <laughs> but he, Richie, did have a bit of a supply line there. And he was into real American country music. 
uh, which all started when he saw a Gene Autry film at the cinema when he was nine or ten. And living where he did, which was a, probably, a, Liverpool was a very poor city, but the area where Richie lived was about the poorest of them all. And they had nothing and they had no prospects and they had no heating and they had no hot water. All these guys had outside toilets. Nobody had a toilet inside the house, let alone a bath. I mean, these <laughs> things were completely unheard of. You would always have to go to a public bath to wash. Mm. So um, this was a very different way of growing up. And he saw Gene Autry on the screen singing South of the Border. And he, he wanted to desperately to go to America and tried to emigrate to Houston, Texas when he was about 19, no, 20 years old. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, it was long, we didn't talk about George yet, but yeah. we talked about George, and I have another question. Okay, uh, George. Uh, George doesn't really have much music in his background. His dad did get a guitar. His dad was a sailor as well, and he first came to New York in about 1927. So both John's father and Paul's father had been to New York, and obviously would talk about America to a degree at home. Yeah. Um, and John's uh, George's father bought a guitar actually, in New York. But their times got tough in the 1930s in the Depression and sold it. But what they had was American records. Uh, he brought back like Roy, Roy Rogers records, uh, singing Breakman and all that kind of stuff. Um, Jimmy Rogers, not Roy Rogers, I'm sorry. That's the cowboy, isn't it? Yes. Um, don't think he made a record. No. Uh, Roy Rogers. Rogers. Oh, well, maybe he did. Yeah, yeah. Happy Trails. Happy Trails. <laughs> oh, right, OK. Um, so there was music around, and also there was the influence of some English music, like George Formby, who I don't know if anybody here has heard of George Formby, yeah. music hall star in England who wrote and sang kind of very saucy songs, risque, double entendre songs. <laughs> um, so they all had music to, it, to some degree or other. Right. Uh, Paul, the most. Um, I want to talk about Brian Epstein. Here's a guy who wasn't, he, you know, he ran a record shop in his parents' store. And all of a sudden, he becomes their manager. And he really sets a revolution off by the way he presented the Beatles and other bands, too. It wasn't yeah. just the Beatles, too. Yeah. How important is Brian Epstein going to the cavern in November uh, of 1961? It's, it's vital. Because the Beatles, as I said, they were, the, they were the hottest act in Liverpool. But that was all. There was no way out. How how'd you get out of Liverpool? How would you get down to London and get a recording contract and become famous? None of them had any idea how to do it. None of the people in London were looking up north because London is always very insular and people just think that if it's not happening there, it's not happening anywhere. So but the music scene as we know it, the books I, I'm writing have to tell the story of how the music business, which was this quaint old thing that began in Tim Pan Alley in New York in the 1910s, how that became the record business and how that crossed the Atlantic. And ultimately, through the Beatles, it became the music industry with these vast multi-million, billion-dollar companies like, like Google, even, um, that, that control all these rights and, 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 and find ways of bringing the music to the marketplace. This was just a very little thing when the Beatles were trying to get a recording contract. And it was the Beatles who actually made that revolution happen. So I must show in these books how the Beatles changed the music business, how they changed the the entertainment business. Um, but Brian was very sure so, but, about them. But, He's, I so, mean, right so, away, he knew something was going so on. So no there. one was, there were, just as there was no group like the Beatles, and believe me, when the Beatles first tried to get a recording contract, one of the reasons they struggled is because no one like that had ever existed before. It sounds so simple. I got drums, bass guitar, lead guitar, rhythm guitar, to one, two, or three guys, or even all four, who sing Same. in harmony and write their own songs. God, it's right. everywhere now. Right. It was nowhere then. And it was so nowhere that no one could recognize that they were new and different. And similarly, Brian Epstein as manager was so different to any manager who had ever been before. And so Brian revolutionized rock management, and the Beatles revolutionized rock music. And he was... He was a young guy who was unfulfilled. He was, um, he was uh, struggling to find his way in life in that he was very good as a businessman. He was good enough to be considered store management material at the age of 21. But he was never satisfied with doing any one thing. So he would start something with immense enthusiasm and after a year he would get bored and go and do something else. He really wanted to be an actor. 
He really wanted to be a dress designer. <laughs> he really wanted to direct plays uh, on the stage. But he couldn't, every time he tried one of those things, it, it, it never really worked. And he ended up dissatisfied back in Liverpool until he saw the Beatles. <laughs> and he was able to bring to them all his ideas for presentation and all his organization in terms of uh, management administration. He was a brilliant administrator. And one of the joys for me on this project, and we talk about how do you get information, is I was able to find Brian Epstein's management files for the Beatles. And that's all completely unseen stuff. Wow. Uh, and I have a very, very strong collection of this. It runs all the way through to his death in 67. Wow. And in fact, beyond. Uh, and all that stuff is completely new, but what it tells me is that this guy was a brilliant organiser. And the Beatles were always the best at what they did, but they had no idea how to organise themselves. They needed someone to come in and shape their direction for them, to actually show them the way to go, and to open up the doors. And he did it. You know, the, the Beatles that we know that Brian Epstein took to the toppermost to the poppermost were John, Paul, George and Ringo. Yeah. But uh, initially, when Brian went down those steps of the cavern in Liverpool and saw the band, there was another drummer there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it's hard to put it into a nutshell, but sort of the story of, of okay. Pete Best. Of how well, yeah, uh, the Beatles always had a problem with, uh, with <coughs> getting a drummer. Uh, in fact, there was a period in 1960 when Paul was the drummer. So they were a four-piece with Paul on drums, but that was always really frustrating for Paul because he wanted to be out front. Uh, so they, this, by a miracle of coincidences, they end up getting offered this trip to Hamburg in Germany. And um, they must go as a five-piece, and it's quite clear that they need to get one more guy and it's going to have to be a drummer because that was what they always lacked. And they knew that there was this kid in Liverpool with a drum kit and no particular day-to-day -day job, so they grabbed him and his name was Pete Best. And Pete Best was their drummer until pretty much the eve of their breakthrough in the UK. And mm. then he was fired. And then poor guy had to watch while the Beatles became the biggest thing that entertainment had ever known. <laughs> uh, I mean, they were hoping to have a hit record or two, but, you know, they actually <laughs> kind of changed the Did world. Did a bit better than that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're still talking about them 50 years later. And he's just ha been having to watch it for 50 years. Right. right. So that was all quite unfortunate. But you, but you do in the book, though, just to, you know... You do explain the story. Well, and yeah, how it I'm, all happened, and you'll the myth. you'll see that it, that the you know the myth. Well, the Beatles the, story is one that attracts a lot of myths. Yes. it's inevitable because everyone thinks they know something of it, and and things get magnified and things get told out of proportion. So, one of the things is why did they fire Pete Best? And, and it's, for some reason, it's been a mystery for fifty years as to why they should fire this guy. Um, Even to him. So he says. <laughs> so he says. <laughs> But actually, it's, it's quite clear when you read the book. And, and it isn't me saying it. It's all the people yes. I talk to. Because yeah. uh, I have interviewed you know, hundreds of people who were witnesses to all these events. And it's absolutely clear that he was never really one of them. And if you're in a band and the chemistry isn't right, then you know it, right? I mean, you're in a band. You know these things. You've got to have the chemistry right. And especially if the front line are so full of personality and so full of exuberance and character, and the guy on the drums is making no eye contact. He's a very shy individual, Pete. Just looks down, doesn't make any eye contact, doesn't smile, doesn't speak to anyone. And after the gig, he just goes home, and the other three hang out together. Well, there's a divide there, yeah. right? And every time they played with Ringo, who was part of this same scene, he was in another band, it felt great. They just immediately thought, this, this, this is the guy. And Paul was, you said Paul played drums for a while. Mm. But Paul was actually the best guitarist in the Beatles, wasn't he, for a while? Paul is pretty good musically at anything he picks up. I mean, yeah. he's just one of those guys who can pick up any instrument and that's it. He's away. Uh, and that can make life difficult in a band when ultimately in the Beatles he's saying to Ringo, no, 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 I could do, you know, <laughs> let, let me show you. Yeah. You know, because obviously you've got to be aware of the chemistry of the, the personalities. But he played, he was, he ended up playing bass guitar. Uh, yeah. But... By During default. Hamburg, right. Who, who was playing bass in Hamburg? Well, they had another guy called Stuart Sutcliffe. Right. Uh, the, the Beatles were originally a five-piece, not a four. And Stuart was brilliant, a brilliant artist. Not so much a brilliant bass player, but a brilliant artist. And he gave the Beatles uh, a, an image and a look that was uh, 
very important to their development. And he also attracted in Germany, in Hamburg, three uh, bright young things who were primarily attracted to, to Stuart first. Mm -hmm who uh, Astrid Klaus and Jürgen, who had a great influence on the Beatles. And that's an interesting story too, because they, they were all war babies as well, Astrid Klaus and Jürgen. And they were so disgusted with their country's behavior that they grew up after the war absolutely appalled to be German because of what their country had done. Uh, and so they shunned everything German and embraced everything French. <laughs> so the Beatles went to Hamburg as young English guys with Irish backgrounds singing black American music and got to Hamburg to meet three people who were totally influenced by Paris and the Beatles became this melange of all of that. Uh, and when they really broke America, they had a continental look, not an English look and certainly not an American look. They were kind of French. Um, you just talk about myths in the Beatles. Um, your book has um, separated some of the myths from the tr uh, and showing the truth. What myths bother you about the Beatles? So many. Um, I have real difficulty reading most books on the Beatles, especially those that have got an agenda. Mm. The writers often have an agenda on something, and they bring that agenda in onto the page, and they're forcing their opinions on you. And I, I you know. For me, it's just about being the narrator. And I just try and weave other stories together in this book. Myths that bother me. Just too many aspects of their story are, they're, they're too pat. These are very interesting, challenging, spiky, difficult, funny, talented, amusing, original people. Uh, and <clears throat> I just think that um, you, you can't easily put a thought on them because they, they were much more diverse than that. So I really need to look at, I look in this book of the Beatles from the outside in and the inside out. And I want to see their chemistry with one another and how they functioned as a unit. I mean, that's how did these four guys stay so sane through such insane times once they became so globally popular? Um, so I look at all that and, but there are so many elements of the story that are too easy. Um, like when they go to India, for example, and they're with the Maharishi, which is often just kind of thrown away as this kind of, you know, this silly period in their career when they just went off to India and, you know, tried to levitate or whatever. <laughs> uh, but in reality, these guys, they're just guys. They're just, they're human beings who are going through an extraordinary time and they're having to deal with what fame is bringing them. Fame on an unimagined scale. No one had ever been as big as the Beatles. They are the ever-present royalty of all celebrity to this day. You go in a room full of celebrities, Paul McCartney walks in, they will all turn to look at him. He's the, he's the tops. And they all were. The same yeah. was true of John and George, and it's still true of Ringo. So they had to deal with this. So at the ages of 25, 26, 27, 28, they decided to go and find out what life was about. Um, to take that journey. But being the Beatles, it became a very, very public thing. It should have been a private thing, but it became very public. And everyone took the mickey out of them for it, and they became kind of the laughing stock. Um, but they, they needed to find out who they were to discover themselves. And when they came back, they were different from before they went. So what happened there in India is worthy of proper look. It's not just to be tossed away as something silly. It's like, this is important. If those guys thought it was important, it's important. And at the same time, being the Beatles, wherever they went, everyone followed. This whole business of people being interested in meditation, um, be, people being interested in spiritualism and Eastern philosophy and so on, that, was, that was, existed for centuries before the Beatles, but they are the great popularizers yeah. of it. Because they did it, it became a, a possibility for everybody else. Now, to be fair, 1968 is going to be in volume three. Yeah. Okay. So we've got to wait well, a little a bit for that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This the, only goes up to the New Year's Eve of uh, 62, this right? This goes up to the very brink of 1963, uh, uh, right. when the Beatles have got a record out in England. They're already being exposed to the American market. They've already been turned down by, at the end of this book, three American record companies, uh, because America was no more prepared to accept what the Beatles were than, than the English market was. Right. They had to force their way in. But once people heard them, that was enough. 
because the music did the rest. Now let's talk about uh, their idols, because we talked about the music a little bit. Who were the Beatles idolizing in Amer for American musicians? Elvis, 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 Elvis. Was it Elvis? Absolutely, it was Elvis. <laughs> I thought. <clears throat> yeah, Elvis Costello was really big in those days. <laughs> uh, yeah, Elvis and also very much Buddy Holly and the Crickets and very much Eddie Cochran and very much Jerry Lee Lewis and very much Carl Perkins, yeah. Little Richard, of course, Little Richard. It didn't matter to them what skin color the person had. Right. Uh, because they just, they, it, it was music. And John Lennon had this extraordinary experience when he was 15, yes, it was April 1956. He had just heard Elvis, and Elvis was the greatest thing he'd ever heard in his entire life. And John Lennon and El would always love Elvis till the day he died. And then some kids in his class at school had been on a school trip to the Netherlands um, and been in a record store there and bought a Little Richard 78. Mm. Now, Little Richard was not available in the UK at this point not until about eight months later. Mm. And this guy called Michael Hill had a record with Long Tall Sally on one side and Slipping and Sliding on the other, a 78. And, and said to John, during the course of a school morning, I've got a record at home by a guy who, who's probably better than Elvis. And John, who had only heard of Elvis for about a month, said, not possible. <laughs> Would have told him it in two short words, no doubt, you know, what he thought of that idea. But at lunchtime, they all bunked out of school, went and got a bag of chips, French fries, yeah. back to this guy Michael's house, put on the record, and John Lennon heard Long Tall Sally for the first time and was completely stupefied wow. and torn because he loved Elvis, and yet he loved this guy as well. <laughs> and then someone said to him that Little Richard was a Negro, as the word was then, black. African American, and it was like, oh my God, uh, they make this music too. I love it, yeah. and they became totally passionate about Black American music from that moment onwards. And to this day, if you ask a little Richard, he says he influenced Paul McCartney all the time. Yeah, well, he? He, he, he'll he tell does. you firsthand. He, I did. He does, and they eventually got to play with little Richard. And for for them, meeting little Richard was like anybody else meeting them. It was like you know them and their heroes. What were the first songs that John and Paul wrote? Together, well, first of all, they wrote separately. Right. And this is a, an, one of so many amazing things in this book. There were hardly any boys in the south end of Liverpool where they were growing up. Liverpool is a big city, so it has a north end, a south end. It doesn't have a west end, because that's the river, <laughs> but it has an east. Um, and they lived in the south end of the city. And John Lennon started writing songs in 1957 at the age of 16. And his first song was called Calypso Rock. <laughs> Because, uh, as I said, America was America believed that rock and roll was this five-minute thing. And we in England, who swallowed everything that you thought, thought it would last five minutes as well. <laughs> so it was going to last five minutes. And it was preserved only by the kids. Because the, the companies were tr already trying to say, well, here's the next fad. And the next fad was going to be Calypso music. <laughs> so if you read Billboard or Cashbox of Variety of 1957, you'll read, Calypso is the coming thing, rock and roll is dead. <laughs> and that filtered across to England, so John Lennon thought, uh-huh, if I'm going to write a song, I'll try and straddle the two things. So he wrote a song called Calypso Rock. Wow. Uh, and then he wrote a song called Hello Little Girl, Hello Little Girl. And Paul, at the same time, and this is where it gets interesting, he was writing a song called I Lost My Little Girl at the same time. So before they met, or around the time they met, they were both individually writing songs. <laughs> so what are the chances of two guys write, two kids writing right. songs. Paul was only 14. What are the chances of them, A, writing songs and then finding each other and then of thinking, let's write together. So unusual were the Beatles in those days that when Brian Epstein was trying to get them a recording contract in London, not only were people telling them you'll never make it from Liverpool and, and, and you, you know, go home and all that kind of stuff, Everyone said to him, you've got to change the name because the word Beatles will never catch on. <laughs> never. Never catch on. <laughs> so, you know, as weird as that sounds, that is the thinking back in 1962. And the Beatles were always about, stuff you, we're going to do it our way. And if you don't like it, we'll, we'll just keep it and, and you'll have to... 
you'll pay for it later. <laughs> <coughs> and when they first went to London, there's, a, there's a, a section in the book when they go to London for the first time to promote themselves and they go around meeting journalists. People were openly hostile to them. <laughs> you know, you, your name is horrible and, and you'll never make it and all that. And they, being the Beatles, they thought, right, mm -hmm. we'll show you. And they never forgot. I mean, very tough-minded guys, the Beatles. Very well, tough. But they had a little bit of trouble with the name in Germany too, didn't they? <laughs> There's a leading question. <laughs> I had yeah. to ask it. In Germany, uh, the, the, the word Beatles will be pronounced as Peedles. Not um, to end on a naughty note, but... Uh, and Peedles actually means uh, the male appendage <laughs> in German, in some kind of slightly schoolboyish uh, talk. Yeah. Um, so. Actually, it's quite, I quite like the fact that in America, you, you always say Beatles with a... a like it's like got a D. A D and we say Beatles with a T, but we say Elvis wrong. Uh, well, Presley, because we say Presley as if it's got what I would call a Z and you call a Z, mm. and you say Presley. Presley. Mm. So we name your greatest star incorrectly, we pronounce it wrong, and you pronounce our greatest <laughs> star Actually, we don't, even, we don't even say the last name, we just call him Elvis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the king. What, yeah. <laughs> what do you, what's Madonna's last name? <laughs> I can't think. I'm just oh, kidding. <laughs> Cuccioni? No, well, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. someone Google it right <laughs> now. Yeah. No, well, you know, there's so much to talk about in this book. I mean, it, it's a, a thousand pages, it really is. Uh, it does go up to 62. You really need to buy it and read it. It's, it's the most incredible detail you will ever read on the Beatles. It really does put into context who they were, why they became who they did, and why they gelled, as you said, why they gelled as ultimately John, Paul, George, and Ringo. It yeah. was John, Paul, George, and, and Pete, uh, or drummer, or undesirable member, as you'll, you'll read yeah. in here. I mean, and then it became Ringo. Um, and, and, and that order is important. Yeah. yeah. Psychologically, the constitution of the Beatles as a band is John, Paul, George, and Ringo because John started it and led them, and he was always the leader. Right. And he brought in Paul, and Paul brought in George, and George brought in Ringo. Mm. So that is not just doesn't just fall nicely off the tongue. It's absolutely essential to understanding the relationships within the group. Yeah. And just to just to add, you know, one of the fascinating things about the book is that it is it's written in a narrative form, and you you see sort of how different people could have, you know, there were some near misses of people who weave yeah. in and out of the Beatles' lives at different times. Yeah. Uh, so many instances of things could have been radically different if, if one domino had been slightly out of place. Yeah. And, uh, you know, while other books will, you'd see a little of that, because you, you have it so beautifully laid out, you really do see yeah. the, the, if you want to say fate, or just the circumstances that put it all together. Brilliantly yeah. done. Yeah. Well, Thank I also you, think you, just a, a little review of the book, you, you look at the bigger circle as well as the inner circle. I yeah. think, you know, the people like Brian Epstein, you don't start where we first meet the Beatles, it's before that, right. George Martin, and other people, yeah. you know, who manage them or in, the in, sphere. in quotes. Well, you know. I, I don't see that, it, I, it, to me, it's always wrong when you get a book where, for example, Ringo joins the Beatles in 62, so most of the books on the Beatles will have their entire story to that point and then bring him in right. and do a little quick backstory and, and that's it. But actually, all these people are growing up in the same city at the same time. Yeah. They're all living there. They're all on parallel tracks that sometimes cross over before they really have met. Uh, and I wanted this to be, this is not a book about legends. This is a book about four people who who thought differently and acted differently and, and were original and daring and prepared to break all the rules. Um, so it's really important to actually put them properly all in the same space at the same time. Mm. And because they're all going to see the same films at the same time in the cinema, the Elvis films or whatever, and they're all listening to the same records and they are crossing over one another even before they know it. <laughs> So it makes it much more of a, of, a, of a cogent and real story if you've actually got them in, in the same place at the same and, time. And also the fact that they also met the right people who believed in them. Yeah. Brian Epstein, George Martin. Uh, if, if they were signed to DECA... They were lucky to get they, Brian Epstein as their manager. They were extraordinarily lucky to get George Martin as their producer. And he, in turn, was extraordinarily lucky to get them. Because yeah. as I find, as I show in the book, he didn't actually want to sign them. He actually had his arm twisted to sign them. Hmm. But as soon as he met them, because he signed them before he met them, as soon as he met them, he knew that they were original. And he worked really, George Martin's 
career fell into two paths, really, which was if he ever followed a, a formula and did whatever the formulaic thing to do was with unoriginal talent, the records were really quite poor. And I, I have a collection of them now. George Martin's poor records. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a box full of them. But if he ever worked with original minds, people who were really creative in, in their own right, um, he would bring all his creativity to the palette as well. And the results were fantastic. So um, meeting the Beatles for George was just the most perfect thing because they were, th their, their thing was always, um, what do you mean we can't do that? You know, it's just like, what do you mean no? Yeah. Well, well, if you say no, we'll say yes, mm -hmm. you know, as the song goes. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, that, I mean, that, that, that actually is Paul McCartney's <laughs> mantra to this right. day. You say yes, I'll say no, or you say no, yeah. I'll say yes. And the Beatles always operated that way. As soon as they got to Abbey Road Studios and they met a, a sheet of paper full of rules like that, they went, well, we're going to do that, and we're going to do that, and we're going to do that, and they just broke them all. <laughs> and because they broke them all, they made Sgt. Pepper and Revolver and Abbey Road and the White Album and all these things that were just, you know, culturally pushing the envelope so far. Yeah. Well, I want, to, uh, I want to open it up to questions in the audience, but I will say, um, as far as the narrative in the book, you do get a sense when you read this that you are in their story. And that's, I think, one of the biggest compliments I can pay you, because you f I felt like I was actually walking down the street with John, with George, with Ringo and Paul, and, and you really were there with them. And that has not happened before in any other book I've read. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, kudos. It is a Thank really you. fascinating book. Really Thank is. Thank you. To bring in the Ruddles humor, you brought in the sights, the sounds, the smells <laughs> of the actual. <laughs> and you'll read about that in the book. There's actually a comment about the smells. So do we have any questions from the audience? From Mark? Sure. Thanks for being here and thanks for writing this book. Uh, as one of the only people in the room who probably saw the Ed Sullivan show the <laughs> first time it was shown. And my father said that can't be their real hair. Uh, it became sort of a genetic piece of my fabric, the, of growing up in my culture and my background. And I wonder if the same sort of feeling happens with any other artist later on. Is there another generation that has another artist that becomes so genetic in their core being, or is this a once in a lifetime, once in a generation, once in a millennium thing? Well, I'll throw this one open to, to the panel here. But um, from my own point of view, I mean, the obvious answer is that every generation has its heroes and every generation has its um, key musical influences. I always think that it's the music you hear when you're, say, 14 to 19 or 20 that has the greatest impacts on you in terms of shaping your opinion. But on the other hand, subsequent generations wouldn't have had anything as profound as the Beatles or as artistically deep and satisfying as the Beatles. You, it, molds can really only be broken once. I mean, you can, there are so many molds to be broken, but the Beatles just, they changed so many things that after that, everyone was in a way always treading in their footsteps. Um, but of course, if you asked an 18-year-old today, it, it, though he might know of the Beatles, which is an amazing thing in itself, uh, he, that wouldn't necessarily be his or her game changer. But that's what I feel. What, what, what uh, you well, you know, to me, uh, Dexy's Midnight Runner uh, <laughs> with Come On Eileen. No, I mean, Great record. Know, there's no one like Dexy's Midnight Runner. No. Uh, no, to me, there's, I mean, you're asking the wrong person because to me, I'm up here because of the Beatles. Um, well, I'm up here because of my parents, but I'm up here really because the Beatles were a big influence on my life. I don't think there's anybody, you have also always said that they, there were circumstances that made the Beatles who they were, and I don't think those can happen again. Yeah. I they, just don't. They were born at the right time, and they entered our lives at the right time as well. Yeah. Um, I think some bands have had a place in rock history. Oh, absolutely. But I think culturally, in the bigger picture, the Beatles, you know, knocked it can so down yeah. so many doors and yeah. stuff. I think, I mean, there was always this thing about who's going to be the next band to be as big as the Beatles, and after about 30 years, eventually people stopped asking. Hmm because it just isn't possible. Uh, times have moved on. I think actually the curse... Well, there's no Ed Sullivan show either. That's well, I was just going to say, I think part of it has to do with the idea that the, the Ed Sullivan show was such a huge simultaneous exposure. Yeah. I think that you know, there have been acts since then. You read about you know, Elton John's performance at the Troubadour that broke him you know, wide open. Mm. U2 had some stunning performances. But these were often 
live performances that were reviewed, you know, Springsteen being called, you know, the future of rock and roll. You know, we, we saw it in individual performances that would get reviewed, but to have had it given to all of us on the Sullivan Show, here it is. It was, you know... And how many bands got started the next day because of the Ed Sullivan Show? Yeah. Well, yeah. it's funny because yeah. I, I feel bad for Elvis because Elvis probably thought the same thing. Well, <laughs> no one's going to be bigger than me. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, it's the Beatles. And like, oh, damn. <laughs> I, I do have a question for you, Mark, that concerns the Sullivan Show. Um, here in America, it's, it's a moment. Yeah. In Great Britain, you didn't have the Ed Sullivan Show as a broadcast we, we there. How was that yeah. looked at from, a, from Great Britain? Well, we only, I mean, I, I used to read about the Ed Sullivan Show for years as a, as a Beatles fan. And also, I was always interested in broadcasting as well. <clears throat> but I didn't actually see it until the video age, when you could actually get to see tapes of things. Right. Mm. Um, for us, that was not the show. For us, we had our own landmark moments. A um, couple of big TV shows the Beatles did. But more than anything else, where is the Beatles? Well, they were number one at the time of the Sullivan Show here. Yes, mm -hmm. But that was where they re the nation saw them for the first time. Uh, in, in England, it happened a few months earlier, and it mostly happened through the records and radio. And then people saw them on television and, and thought they were great. Right. We didn't have that one single defining moment like you've had here. <laughs> yeah. We have a next question from uh, Mark Lapidos. Uh, we should just tell everybody that Mark Lapidos is the founder of the what was known as Beatle Fest in 1974 and since changed to the Fest for Beatles fans. And Mark Lewison is going to be a guest. Uh, if you want to tell people about that after your question. Sure. Uh, first of all, there are other people here who were there for the Ed Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a little known fact that to this day, it's the largest audience in the history of American television by population size. Right. Mm. So the right. population was like 160. So it's like, I think 42%, something like that. Mm. And Super Bowl never gets more than 33%, I don't think. Right. So that Ed Sullivan show, even, as George said, of course, many times, uh, even the criminals stayed home to watch us. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I have a question. I have no idea if you're writing about this because this book only goes up to the end of 62 and I'm only up to like, page 50 or 60. It's gonna take me maybe 10 years to get through <laughs> it. Uh, but I'm loving it so far. Uh, I don't know how much you delve into the music part of it, but I guess for book three, I have a, a bit of Beatles trivia I'd like to ask you about. I asked George Martin and he answered it, but I want to know if you know about this, uh, what your answer would be. Penny Lane, I met with him about 20 years ago. I said, can I ask you one trivia question? He said, sure. I said, what happened at the end of Penny Lane? Why is it only on the promotional single in the US? So do you have the answer, Mark? Why? Just let people know well, what the they're... No, you the, mean the, the trumpet the, uh, ending? The, trumpet, the trumpet ending. The trumpet ending. It's only on the promotional single. It never made it on the, the American single or album. D did he tell you it was because Paul wanted to change it at the last minute? No. What did he tell I'll you? I'll give you an answer in a minute. <laughs> but well, now we know what the I answer is. Now we know the answer. I'm, this is exactly what he said. He said, we were just putting up making music. We just sent it over. It's like it, it, He didn't even know it. He was like, all right. It will send it over. Oh, it's not finished. It doesn't matter. You just do it. Never gave it a thought. Yes. <laughs> it yeah. surprised the hell out of me. They were, they were turning out product. I mean, that is you know, another amazing thing about the Beatles is that all the recorded material that we know and love all came out in the space of about seven and a half years. Uh, I mean, 13 albums in seven and a half years. In the U if you're looking at the UK product, which is the way they shaped it. Uh, and all those singles and, and other tracks as well. I mean, 200 odd tracks in seven years. An act these days would probably do one or two albums yeah. Yeah. in that sure. time. Probably, uh, sure. And they, they, they completely wiped clean uh, and drew again the face of popular music in that period. Um, one of the things I do in this book is I actually name number all the years. <clears throat> So 1958 is really the year when the Beatles are first. They're not the Beatles yet, but in fact, they went around as a trio at one point, John, Paul, and George, called J. Page Three. <laughs> it was a new discovery. That yeah. was something that had never surfaced yeah. before. Where did that, where did you find well, it? Well, I just was, it, um, tracked down this guy who was actually their manager <laughs> for a while and had a recording of them that he wiped, unfortunately. Um, but they, they were J. Page Three, J. for John, P. A. for Paul, and G. E. for George, and Three because they were a trio. Uh, three guitarists and um, 
That is year one, 1958, when they start going around together is year one. So 1964, when they played the Sullivan show, that's year seven. You know, there is a tendency in America yeah. to think they kind of arrived when they played the Sullivan show, but that was year seven, and when they broke up, it was year 13. Now, they don't get a recording contract till year five, yeah. but, but that doesn't mean they're not together. They're still, you know, very much working and finding out who they are and <clears throat> young lads having fun and all that and, and having adventures. But mm -hmm. um, so actually they were together 13 years, wow. much more than people realize. What? And uh, we did, we did want to say that um, Mark will be at the Fest for Beatles fans on the Sunday, uh, February 9th. Correct. Um, the anniversary of the Sullivan Show. Absolutely. So uh, look. I forward should be doing my Ed Sullivan impression. <laughs> oh, good. Right I'll be here. doing my Topo Gigi impression. <laughs> <laughs> I'm short enough. So, uh, do we have any other questions for Mark? We're being told to wrap it up. We're being told to wrap it up. <laughs> but do, if we, one more question. Anybody? Al. I'm Actually, it did have one. Can you go to the mic, please? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> and then I believe Mark right. will be doing signing. Oh, we, we don't? don't? I'm sorry, Al. You, uh, we can ask it in private, Al? <laughs> yeah, ask it in private, Al. Sorry. Okay, um, we'll ask it after. Real, real quick. Oh, sorry. Um, Mark, you talked about the, the hostility that, uh, that the London music establishment had toward Liverpool. Yes. Or indifference, maybe. And yet there was, in that first batch of teen idols... Uh, there was one Liverpudlian, Billy Fury. Yes. But he didn't apparently become sort of an icon for the other, you know, budding musicians in Liverpool. Was yeah. there a particular reason for that? Yeah, Billy Fury was the first Liverpool rock and roll star before the Beatles. Uh, his real name was Ronald Witcherly, and <laughs> he actually was in the same class at school as Ringo. Um, but he... So embarrassing was the Liverpool accent, or perceived to be in those days in the UK, and that's another thing the Beatles did. They complete, in my country, in England, they completely changed the class system. Well, not changed it, but challenged it, and, and opened it up to people, because they had northern working class accents, and that had, never, that had always been embarrassing before. Mm. Um, Billy Fury was um, never said a word publicly because of his Liverpool accent. His manager said to him, don't speak. <laughs> and when he sang, he sang in an American voice. So no one really knew he was from Liverpool. It wasn't important. But when the Beatles broke through, it's like, yeah, we're from Liverpool. We're from the North. You got a problem with that? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that was a real challenge to people, and which is why they received hostility to begin with. But eventually, within about a year, everyone was putting on a Northern accent yes. to be cool. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just a, a small measure of the impact that they had.